There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. It was basically a cube with inside of sphere where the points of the cube uh, were touching outside of the sphere. So this isn't anything that just is limited to the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. Delighted to say I'm being joined not by a guest this time but Dan is back from Colombia. I think it's almost a month to the day since we recorded so Dan welcome back. It's uh, it's nice to be back. It was an amazing adventure and just before we say anything about it I just want to say thank you to all the listeners who contributed to help send me. It was beautiful and it felt right that I'd been sent there to experience such a, it, it was very spiritual and I'll kind of explain when we do the longer form things, but yeah, it was a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, obviously really good to have you back, Dan. It's been a strange old month. I think I mentioned in the March update pod that the tech issues I had probably came at a good slash awful time because you being away, <laughs> I was slightly ahead anyway with interviews and they were uploaded already. If people saw how I recorded the Diana Pasilka interview, it was on a really, really old laptop that uh, almost died with the amount of... I was using every single port on the laptop for connections, and it died when I first hit record before Diana came on when I was <laughs> testing it. So I was proper panicking, but we managed to get it done, and I don't think anyone should notice anyway. Uh, but it's good to have you back. There's, I mean, there's a lot to talk about. A lot's happened in the world, let alone... Uh, I'm saying world, and people were commenting on that. A lot's happened around the globe. <laughs> uh, well, you've been away, obviously, but in terms of UFOs, it's been it's been pretty busy as well. So this is a nice kind of recap for almost the the whole of February, including the last couple of days worth of news yeah. as well. Um, first up, Dan, your, your time away. We're going to cover when the time's right on the podcast with Ash and Vinny and everything as well. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's any secret. It's been mentioned before that you guys, it's a TV or it's a documentary, it's a production. You've had to sign NDAs. That's not anything to do with super secret government UFO stuff. It's just no. that's what you do when you're making a production like that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's kind of standard practice. And the the way we treated all the stuff that we shot for ourselves was as kind of behind the scenes aspect of it. So it might be that everybody sees the documentary and then we can just fully open up about it and, you know, show all of the photos and videos that we shot around and, and share the conversations we had. Um, there's one particular hilarious moment that... Uh, that Vinny of Disclosure Team and the nickname DJ Disclosure. Uh, I won't spill the beans, but there, there's some funny, funny moments there. Nice. I look forward to it. Um, we were doing the Dan's Diary stuff and I got most of them out and then it died one day, didn't it, the PC? And I was just totally set back. And it's only literally in the last 10 minutes I've managed to get all the stuff back up and running. I got my PC back last night. I've got the Mac, which was a whole conversation that we, was had at the time online as well. Thanks to everyone who supports the pod, because without that, I couldn't have went and got the, the setup back as quickly as I did. And uh, my wife very much appreciates it as well. So so thank you very <laughs> much, folks. Um, Dan, when can we expect the trailer for Phenomenology? Uh, I would expect the trailer ASAP. Um, I've seen a number of cuts of it already. Uh, we, you know, we we get to feedback, like Ashley said, as kind of on on a producing level to kind of say, hey, maybe try this, try this. Um, and it, and it's actually really nice that it feels like a, you, you know, uh, almost a, a student film, but it certainly doesn't look that way. You know, I've shown you the trailer, and you you said that it looked fantastic production wise. So that that bodes well. I don't know if you could say that or not, but yes, I've seen the trailer <laughs> and it does look uh, phenomenal. I'll use that pun. Um, it looks very clean and crisp. And like I said to folks, when we do get to discussing it, I'm not going to pull punches with questions and hopefully I get to see an early copy of... The... I'm a little scared of you, you know. <laughs> we, should, we, should, we should be because, uh, like I say, I, I, I was pretty critical of shows like uh, The Observers uh, and what may or may not have been shown within those and um, a few other documentaries we've talked about as well so I'm not going to be, just be really nice because I get on with yourself and Ashley and, and yeah, Vinny yeah, it'll be it'll be scrutinized as well as it should be and if it's not what I enjoy in a documentary I'll, I'll certainly say that anyway folks but I'm looking forward to it because yes production wise it does look fantastic as well so really interested to see that and keep an eye on that soon you can subscribe to the Phenomenology YouTube channel 
Uh, we'll put the link in the description, Dan, if you can make a note for that, because I, yeah, I'm getting sure. better at that, but still not 100% on it yet. Um, I will put those in there, and the YouTube folks are the worst ones for chasing me up on <laughs> saying I'm going to put a link in the description, then, and I don't do it, and then I, I go in the comments afterwards. So uh, we do try and get there, folks. Um, next up, another documentary that's coming out, uh, I believe, in April is A Tear in the Sky, part of UAPX's long-awaited production they've talked about. Um, you can check out a tear in the sky.com. Again, link in the description. It's a tear in the sky.com, dodgy accent. Again, that's got a trailer expected very, very soon. I again would expect high production values. The UAPX group, uh, Gary Verhees and Co., it's a big group. They have they've promised quite a lot with this as well, haven't they? Again, they've mentioned they've got a strict NDA they are under, but they're certainly not shy and i'm not saying they're overhyping or anything I, I don't think so but they're they're really confident that they've got some very good data they've potentially got some some good footage if i'm reading between the lines and this is certainly something that we should be looking forward to what are your kind of aspirations or hopes for that one dan yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to it i i think the the speculation around it kind of proves the point as to why you know these ndas exist it's basically to say you know whatever we found we're not going to speculate about but it will be shown when the final piece is shown um and kind of playing that hand early and saying you know we have 600 hours of data um certain anomalies might be present and we don't know what to make of them it's it's a little bit cut before the horse i i almost wish you know everyone just bit their tongue until it was just there to present um but but i'm excited to see what they found um especially in the they they were working with some people who will apply some scientific rigor and logic to it, try and get some repeatability out of it. And so I, I think it's going to be a, a very productive documentary and data set. Do you know what I think safe to say? And this this comes with kind of years of watching these types of shows as, as a fan and everything. And especially in the last 18 months or almost two years, actually doing this podcast now, um, which is crazy. It's been two years almost that you're not going to get, you know, disclosure or whatever that means to you in one of these documentaries. That includes, you know, Dan uh, Dan and Ash's documentary, Phenomenology, uh, the the phenomenon with James Fox. Oh, I, I don't know. We, we we met some beings in the mountain and we, we've had to ask how they'd like to be credited. And, you know, some of them mentioned Anjali. It got pretty awkward. I'm, I'm, sure <laughs> I'm kidding for what it's I'm, worth. I'm sure that'll get cut out the final one. That'll be a bonus extra one for the beings <laughs> that we met. But, but that, that's the thing, though, that... It, Skinwalker Ranch, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to name as many as I can here, unidentified the series, for, uh, the phenomenon with James Fox, his new one, the phenomenon too, none of these documentaries are going to contain, you know, here's disclosure, here is concrete proof of that smoking gun footage that's fully 100% confirmed by everyone in scientists and government, because that sort of event would be breaking news tonight, it would be the, the NASA announcement, 10pm, you know, worldwide announcement, that's yeah, what yeah, you would absolutely. get. So we any documentary, it was, it's going to be, it's going to be informative. Sorry, I was going to say yeah. that. That's it, and it's going to be what you want to take from it as well. So, I think yeah, with yeah, any absolutely. of these things, people just have to temper their expectation. Don't go into it hoping for it's going to show me definitive proof that UFOs exist. We know they exist, but you know what I mean, folks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're we're kind of at a point where these documentaries can provide like confirmation or backup for that confirmation. Lou was speaking about that the other day, um, but. You, you're not going to, you know, if someone presents a, a bit of material and says that's a UFO in a documentary, you're going to want to see that material. You want you see the analysis. Mm -hmm. You want it to get it to Gary Nolan to do analysis. And, you know, it's not just about putting an image on screen. I think we all know by this point that that's pretty easy to fake. Yeah. And for years, we, uh, and to make a point, thinking of everything I've just named there is in the last four years or less, maybe even three years with the phenomenon unidentified. Uh, obviously, a tear in the sky is coming out. The, pheno the phenomenology is coming out. Before that, it was always a handful of documentaries that you would point to for, for UFO documentaries. But now we've got more and more coming out. But what we've also got is the, the science being involved with them as well. Like you say, it's no longer that found footage or here's some clips of UFOs. What we've got is, is scientists and data being presented to people as well, because I think the demands of what people want from these types of, of features has increased so much. And the bar with like the, the phenomenon with James Fox was set so high that there's not much point in making anything else that's that's not going to try and at least adhere to that sort of standard. Safe to say the uh, phenomenology set out in Colombia is quite a, a focus on a specific phenomenon in a specific area. So you don't expect that huge, huge, huge budget that maybe 
other documentaries may have or have had in traveling around the world but like james fox with the virginia case you're going to get a great look at one particular area the people involved the human side of it but also now the science involved in it as well and like you say the production values are at least a minimum you would expect now going forward yeah definitely i mean you you know it's no secret that an iphone can shoot 4k video now in you you know prores video that's about as professional as you can get um you you know those those codecs are used on film sets actual film sets and tv shows now you know the way that they used to use gopros the phone is just versatile it's light it's cheap you you know you can just so the like you said the the bar for great production is a lot more accessible or a lot more a lot easier to jump over these days um yeah let me ask dan but with those uh high-res phones that we have now why have we still not got a decent picture of a ufo i'm joking i'm joking Just, i mean i was gonna answer you I, i'll give you an answer <laughs> basically the phones are there to shoot people in front of you uh the phone cameras and that's what they're optimized for not shooting things very far away and i, I think samsung and huawei have some really cool kind of periscope lenses that we get those zooms on um apple are a little ways away from it but I think, I think it's coming we're, we're kind of hitting those special use cases now you know they're very good general cameras but in terms of specialist zoom in close up um you know, they, we, we've got some ways to go. There's even a phone that has a FLIR camera on it and you can kind of cycle through the modes, but it's an Android one and it's not made by any reputable manufacturer. But it just goes to show how accessible these technologies are becoming. Yeah. So there you go, folks. Listen, let's move on, Dan. Lots to still talk about. Uh, Luis Elizondo has a new media run. He doesn't just pop up now and again. He tends to do these things in a cluster. Um, He's already appeared on Christina Gomez. He has already appeared with uh, Vinny from Disclosure Team. Uh, He was also on with Sean Cahill on that one and some other guy, Dan, wasn't he? Some other dude, yeah. You managed to muscle your way in. (laughs) You muscled your way in on the the marquee, which was uh, upsetting. Yeah, that was a, a, a pinch me moment. And yeah, it was upsetting for some people. You know, <laughs> it was like ordering like a really nice steak and someone coming out with a really poor salad on the side, but making you eat it. Yeah. How dare you speak about Cahill <laughs> like that? Oh, Sean will love that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, uh, I've not managed to catch all up on all these shows yet. I've actually got, because Lou is of course coming on uh, with ourselves in a couple of weeks, um, I've kept them all for when I'm getting ready to research and write that interview. And I'll go through as many interviews as I can to make sure as usual, folks, we don't repeat stuff and we make it fresh and everything else that, that goes along with that as well. But how how was that, Dan? Was there much uh, an, of interest as such, which I'm sure there was? Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. You know, Sean came on, uh, Sean Cahill came on to uh, that UFO podcast Discord, uh, which is accessible for for Patreon members. And he did a bit of a Q&A that turned into a video chat with the audience, which was amazing. And organized during that, chaos. Yeah, organized chaos. And, uh, and he, he said that, Basically, there's a question that Lou should be asked, and we should we should kind of be interested in the answer. And the question was what it means to be human. And we had the opportunity to ask Lou and Sean that question during the chat on Disclosure Team Vinny's channel. So I'd recommend people go and have a listen to the answers of those because they're very insightful. And and both Sean and Lou are very um, well, we'll say kind of spiritual. Sean more so, uh, very very humanist and. Uh, uh, a chaotic time in the world like this it's nice to hear such positive words about what it is to be human why do you think lou is doing this run now dan through these various podcasts and outlets because again i don't think he's just decided that you know i fancy doing some podcasts over the next few weeks and taking up several hours of my day each day to to go through those as much as uh it goes on podcasts big and small which is which is great for for loads of different people to to cover their platforms and speak to Lou and have their kind of voice heard but why now are we getting ramped up for something something new potentially possibly i i think there's also an aspect of since the last time Lou did a round of interviews, there's been a lot more interest in the subject and there's going to be people kind of coming in and catching up and it gives those people an opportunity to ask some questions um, and get some new information because new people means new angles, means new questions. And, and some of them pick up on things that we we haven't, you know, us that are in it every day, simply neglecting to ask almost. Um, so yeah, it, it's really great that he does this to to get those extra angles. I've had some great listener questions sent over already for Lou. Um, But like I say, I I would rather hold off. Lou was very kind to say that the interview was meant to be last week, but he offered that if I waited a few weeks, he could give me more time, which I'm always happy to 
I'll wait a couple of weeks for an extra 10 minutes, let alone an extra half yeah, hour. So, sure. um, yeah, keep the questions coming in, folks, as much as I can. I'll build them into the body of the interview and ask what I can. But as always, time is limited. So so thanks very much for, for sending those over. But I look forward to speaking to Lou in a couple of weeks' time. Dan, next up, uh, this is one that you put down yourself. Robert P. Storch, President Biden's nominee for the DOD IG, um, pressed by Senator Gillibrand or Gillibrand about UAPs. This was the a few weeks ago now, wasn't it? Yeah, this happened while I was out in Colombia. Uh, Robert P. Storch is yeah Biden's nominee, as you said, for Inspector General of the Department of Defense. Uh, we know that the IG is investigating the DOD's handling of UAP at the moment. Uh, so it was great to see Senator Gillibrand bring it up and ask how familiar he was with the issue. Um, basically, he uh, he confirmed that he's not very familiar, but said that if he was confirmed, he'll follow through with current efforts involving the comprehensive assessment of the subject. Um, and then Gillibrand really held his feet to the fire and basically said, you know, make sure you do kind of thing. Um, it in was, to speak, we'll say. Yeah, it was like a teacher scolding another teacher in school and, uh, you know, one of the more respected teachers because he didn't seem too fussed, did he? Even when no. it was almost he wanted to make sure it was a throwaway comment and a throwaway answer. And yeah. she, she didn't let that happen. And like you say, she very much stamped her authority and let him know that, you know, you've you've got to do this i'm telling you to do it so make sure you do otherwise your 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 nominations under threat which was which was really interesting and again i'm sure that that's done in so many other aspects of the conversation and so many more questions are asked that we don't have an interest in or don't see but it was great it was done under the the guys in premise talking about ufos and uap where no no we're taking this seriously now so get yourself up to speed which was great to see and i think there was a lot of conversation i had at the time online on twitter the videos have been shared by everyone and the the comments and the clips and yeah it was it was great to see it was nice to see him squirming yeah yeah it's always nice to see official squirming because of uap uh the the cherry on that one of course being biden when he tried to run away from the podium and got all tangled up in wires yeah, President Biden's not had a great couple of days, it looks like, from reading the... Not to get political when I get loads of folk getting in touch who are on the right or on the left in the US politics. I don't particularly care either way. Like, it's, it's they all they all kind of do the same thing. You, but... you know, right right here, I'm just going to interject and saying in Colombia, we there were some conversations. Some of the people there were on very opposite sides of the aisle in terms of political allegiances or mm -hmm. tastes you know however you want to preferences we'll say political preferences um and we managed to you know there were five six seven of us and we all managed to put all that stuff aside to solve the case and all of us had very permanent quite pertinent questions in terms of solving these things so it didn't matter what side of the aisle they were from you know they helped the case um just a little small microcosm of example of, of what you were just saying basically absolutely and again politics aside folks you know these are the people, Republican, Democrat, whatever you are, wherever you're based in different countries that are going to potentially be working on this topic and we're just looking for, for progress. So that's it. And again, the politics aside, some of these people vote for some nasty things and some awkward things and horrible things in their time. But from a, a UFO point of view, that's what we focus on. And that's what we know. Especially, I don't know enough about UK politics, let alone US. So you have to let me off for that one. And if not, Ruffle copter. I don't know. I can't really say much more. Gonna <laughs> people are going to be like Ruffle copter. Look it up. Google. It's very it. yeah. You just aged yourself tremendously. Yeah, very, very early. <laughs> yeah. Oh, maybe even slightly later than nineties, but yeah, early two thousands at most. Um, Dan, next one. If you don't mind taking that for me, sec nav foyer UAP because I've just seen you tweeting about this today. Yeah, for sure. So th this was a real interesting one. The the Secretary Navy um foyer reading room hosts uh, or hosted those three videos initially uh flia go fast uh, and gimbal and they've been adding documents over the course of the last few years and today a whole bunch more documents got added about 16 by my count um i basically wrapped them all up in a neat file and put them somewhere for people to download so you can find my tweet there'll be a link in the description to that um but there were a number of things in there that were interesting so firstly there was a uap classification guide um, that told people what they could and couldn't speak about in terms of UAP, which was very interesting. There was a lot of redacted text in it, just lots of black boxes. Um, and they emphasized that just because something is unclassified, it doesn't mean it's okay for public release, which of course was a, a point of debate on the, the I, I want to say the DD-9910 form, I think it was, that Lou, Lou Elizondo applied for the 
those three videos to be released under. Um, yeah. It was unclassified, but you know they're kind of making the distinction now. Um, it Can I just make a point on that? Because yeah, sure. I think I've brought this up before, but and it, it happens from time to time in conversation. There are so many reasons, like you say, why something can't be declassified or at least even given to public for consumption and that's not always just to do with the technology for example i've used this and there will be so much more but just that for example where the pictures may be taken it could be that let's use a really current example it could be that it would be the us over russia for example and they just happen to be in an area where they shouldn't be but there was a, a UAP or UFO incursion. They took a photograph. So from a classified point of view, they, they can see what it is. And it might be a camera phone or it might be tech or a video that we think shows the video. But actually where the video or picture was taken is the classified portion of it and not even necessarily the fact there's a UFO in the background. Yeah, yeah. So there's all these kinds of reasons, which is rubbish. I'm not saying I stick up for that and I'm all for that. I want to see whatever we need to see. But that's even the kind of stuff that people don't necessarily think about. And until I was told about it, I was like, ah, right, okay, so there's something else I'd never even considered before. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. They, they mentioned that here, actually, that basically the, the classification default for something is akin to the most classified thing in that setting or picture. So like you say, if they were in a location that they weren't meant to be, everything will be classified because of that location. Even if you took a picture on your camera phone of a black square, you just wouldn't be allowed to share it because of the location. Um, so yeah, they, they certainly tend to overclassify things um, by default and then work backwards from there, which I, I think has come up as an issue for a lot of politicians in America, mm. that the DOD are kind of overextending that, that, those classifications. Um, they define uh, an identified aerial phenomena as basically any aerial phenomena that can't be immediately identified, uh, which is like a nice broad swath of, of things. Um, and there's a, a really interesting table in the document that labels what's classified, what's unclassified with regard to UAP. In terms of unclassified, there are five, five or six things specified. So they're allowed to talk about the terms and what it means. They're allowed to talk about the witnesses and the systems uh, picking up UAP, but they're not allowed to specify the time and place. They're allowed to specify there's an increase in frequency in recent years without, again, when, where, how, who, you know, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. They're allowed to talk about the fact there's a Navy effort to gain insight into the nature, origins, capabilities, performance, signatures, and operations of the UAP. Again, not allowed to specify exactly what those things are. They're allowed to talk about the task force and the task force's remit. Um, and then just below that in the table, there's a whole section labeled intelligence collection, exploitation, analysis, and products. And obviously that's going to be the interesting stuff. And it's all classified, I'm afraid. <laughs> yep. Uh, but, I, but I thought it was interesting that it says that they're not allowed to talk about the where, when. And we have gotten some of the where, when. You know, through even even in this these file releases, there are some deck logs that specify the where and when of these incursions. Um, so I wonder if something shifted since this document was created that enables them to to talk a bit more about that. I think we'll put the links again for that in the description, folks, because Dan, you've put it all in kind of one handy place as well, haven't you? But as you say, we're, you're still going through those and it's that fresh. I've not even had the chance to look at those yet. Um, something yeah, that was a little yeah. bit hot, hot off the press and, and the same sort of topic where John Greenwald has just mentioned that there were some uh, declassified uh, briefings released. Yeah, this, this was in the same pile. Was it the same pile? Yeah, I wasn't. Yeah. I wasn't too sure. I saw you're it psychic. All. I think this was the next thing I was on my list now. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it was. Um, I saw the kind of tweets coming in as I was. I was doing some stuff and work and everything else, and it seems to show if I'm right without doing one hundred percent of the digging yet or even asking you. This is how off the cuff this is, folks. I'm putting Dan on the spot. They seem to have released one of the Snoopy team's actual photographs from one of the drone incursions over the was it the omaha or the russell yeah you mean like the the three three dots essentially on a portrait photographic image um that's a fleer image i think it is but it just shows essentially three things in the air you, you can't really get any details there but there's another picture of an actual drone like uh, a, a full-on quadcopter type drone oh sure yeah 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 and i take it that's a legit picture and not just one that's been used for for demo purposes on there well, the trouble is that a lot of the captions are, are blanked out, so you can't see where they're attributed to. And we're go we're going to use some behind the scenes magic here, Dan. I'm going to pause, and then we're going to come back and know the sure. answer as to what it was. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. right, right back, it. folks. Doo -doo -doo.
I am delighted to welcome a new sponsor to the podcast, VinoVest. As you all know, I've got a young family and I'm always looking at ways I can save and invest for the future. Fine wine has long been a cornerstone of wealth generation and preservation. The problem? Historically, it's been reserved for the ultra-wealthy. VinoVest is changing that. VinoVest is a platform allowing investors to own 100% of their portfolio and easily buy, sell or drink from their collection of fine wines. After missing out on all those next big things to invest in, I'm always looking for what is the next big player in the industry. I was amazed at how easy it was to get started in diversifying your investment portfolio. Wine has one third the volatility of the stock market and has outperformed the global equities market over the past 30 years with 10.6% annualised returns, proving that the returns can be as robust as your favourite red. VinoVest makes it easy to acquire new investments, equipped with a team of world-class sommeliers who evaluate wine and determine which ones will gain value over time. You own the wines in your portfolio outright. You can buy, sell and even drink them whenever you want. Enjoy historical returns, direct ownership of world-class wines, portfolio diversity and robust recession resistance. Go to zen.ai forward slash that UFO pod zero. That's the number zero. The link is also in the description to receive two months of fee free investing. That's two months of fee free investing. It's time to start investing with VinoVest today. We're back, folks, and Dan and I have spent several minutes now looking at the the tweets. Like I say, they came out about an hour ago on the timeline, so we were still. We're about about to record basically when we looked. I'm not much further forward than on what John's presenting exactly because at a glance it looks like, well, here's the events that we initially thought were potentially UAPs, but on the same slide there's an unclassified picture of what is like a quadcopter drone. So is yeah. John getting at that? Well, that's what the event was because that's the way it comes across. But sure. I the... don't think that's necessarily the case, is it? The the context is important, I think. In in that tweet the jumper out, we've got the the DD one nine ten form. That's the one that Lou I got that wrong a second ago. I said nine nine ten, but one nine ten. Uh that's the one that Lou submitted and mm-hmm. specified UAS basically on, on to, to get those out on the form. Um then you've got another separate email, and then you've got another separate thing again that is from the release today that is from a briefing that was being put together. If you read those run of emails, they're talking about draft briefings and that image pops up um, or that slide pops up as part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. We can see the contents on the briefing, the October 23rd briefing. That's the only thing that's not redacted in there. And I guess the slide. Um, And the contents have background. They have task force partnership, potential threat, fleet and air crew perceptions, data examples, foreign interactions and addressing the problem. I imagine that this is probably a slide from data examples. It's just an example of data being collected. Here's, here's what it could be. Yeah, yeah exactly. here's what it could be because we have seen one of these potentially in the past. But I've seen people already in the comments saying that that type of drone that's pictured, uh, they've got it themselves and it can't fly that far out. And I think what we're also missing and we're not going to have is all that extra data as well, isn't it? That yeah, um, exactly. You're you're going to be able to you know people getting those briefings will probably be asking you know were there other data to corroborate this kind of stuff and the ones that we can take a picture of and see that it's a quadcopter, they're not anomalous. But I've said yeah. this before, you know, it's going to be in the same data pile because it all falls outside the remit of the current technical capability that we have. Um, you, you know, that's broadening. So we're starting to see all these other objects and these stranger objects that are playing in those areas, possibly even, you know, using that hiding in plain sight and presenting themselves in, in, as as anomalous. Uh, but like I said before, again, that doesn't work unless there's something actually anomalous to be confused with. Sure. And again, that's not to say, folks, that some of these or many of these incidents aren't some form of drone. But I think, and we don't want to go on about other things going on in the world too much just now. There's plenty of that in the news. But when you hear about, and, and we've said it, we always say US, Russia and China in terms of technology, it certainly seems that the argument that this could be Russian technology is on the the way down the pecking order isn't it because you're looking at what's happening in ukraine just now and i doubt that's russian technology not to say it's not chinese but we've seen china china recently testing a hypersonic missile that flew around the earth the us claimed they knew nothing about i would doubt that again but 
yeah, it, it's interesting, and I'm sure John will clear that up more as people ask questions. And I would encourage folks to to jump on there, and John's always more than happy to answer these in the yeah in his for quest sure. quest for truth. As John John it. is very familiar with a lot of the acronyms and the way that those processes sure. work, so I'm sure he'll see some things in the emails either side of that slide that that many other people wouldn't. So yeah, maybe maybe I'll ping him back actually after we record and just say hey, shed some light on the context of this. Yeah, Andy's an idiot. Can you make it simple for him? That would be great. <laughs> so yeah, um, again, something else that's dropped in the last day or two. Uh, first off, Ryan Sprague had teased a little bit of news uh, from Daniel Otis. He's written an article on Vice. Uh, the Canadian government has released around 20 years worth of UFO sightings and reports from police officers, pilots, civilians. Um, it's got your, your usual mix in there, but there's some really interesting reports within that too and i think what i always enjoy is that it's not coming from the us because we hear so much about the us and it's great to see other countries getting involved uh, and being a little more potentially transparent on the subject the the name chris rutkowski is brought up within the body of the article a canadian researcher he's coming on the podcast at the end of march i'm just waiting and getting a date for that as well because his new book's coming out uh, canada's ufo is declassified so probably pretty good timing uh, i believe some of these reports were initially dug up through through chris Rutkowski as well so uh pretty interesting what were your thoughts dan yeah it, it's amazing both daniel otis and, and chris have done some incredible work over the past few years and it, it's great to see them getting some of the the credit for the work because they, they're truly finding a stack a whole stack of data that we just mm. didn't know existed um and, and some really interesting events because they're all, well, not all, but some are corroborated between multiple witnesses or multiple sensors. So again, a really interesting data pile. Um, on that, we'll have to give Ryan Sprague a shout out because he has already had uh, Daniel Otis on his channel. Well, actually, Chrissy Newton of The Debrief and other podcasts has just joined Somewhere in the Skies as Ryan's co-host. And she has done the interview, I believe, solo with Daniel Otis. You can check that one out. It was on Ryan's Patreon Early Access, which I'm a member of. I, I would encourage. And you know what? As a, a quick aside, there's still a lot of arguing going online on the social media side of things, Dan. People, there's lots of great content out there. Support who you want. Don't support who you don't want to. You don't have to listen. You don't have to watch. You know, I appreciate anyone who listens and checks this one out. Um, you might not always like the guests and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that goes for anyone's shows. But I think we're just lucky. There's a lot of selection and choice out there just now from a variety of people. Ryan is one of those, of course, as, as well as many others who do a really good job. And uh, I, I would always say if you can and you're in a position to support, listen early, um, early access ad free or listen on the free feeds which is equally as important to to any of us creating content as well so so thanks very much and well done to to ryan and chrissy getting that interview out there so quickly as well as the the article broke fair enough dan yeah yeah absolutely um just wanted to say big congratulations to chrissy and ryan as well they make a fantastic team um and and they're both a ferocious amount of passion for this subject so i think we're we're very lucky to have them yeah, definitely. So yeah, go and check that one out, folks, as well. Check out the article. And I might reach out to, to Daniel Lotus myself to to get him on to have a chat through that as well. So but yeah, I'm sure again it's on my list. I've not listened to the full interview yet, but I, I've heard clips of it and Chrissy does a great job within that too. Dan, interesting one I saw uh, last week or two weeks ago being advertised was Gary McKinnon, an AMA on Reddit. Now, Gary McKinnon was famously the hacker who broke into NASA's systems and allegedly found evidence of an et cover-up i have tried a couple of times over the last year to get gary on the podcast he's always been very kind and responded that uh, initially he wasn't looking to do it to do interviews um he said potentially next year that was very recently so i've put that one back in the books folks for 2023 to get in touch with gary um but he has felt comfortable enough to come out and do an interview um on unwritten text format uh, as part of reddit's ama uh, a few highlights for me uh, and, and reading through that, folks. And again, we'll put the link in the description. Um, he was asked about Stephen Greer early on. And he uh, said, and I quote, I feel that anyone who can do that on their own, uh, that was CE5, without the need to spend a shed load of coin. Um, he brings up uh, Lou Elizondo and Stephen Greer at different points. He talks about seeing the list of non-terrestrial officers. Now, this is, I suppose, one of the biggest claims that Gary has come out with. He got in a lot of trouble, of course, for, for doing this um, with names and ranks of officers. When he was asked on the, the chat, Dan, about the, 
do you remember any of the names that you saw, for example? Bear in mind, this was done back in the day with a 56k dial-up modem. Yeah, um, very so, slow. Yeah, the picture he saw and the, the information he was getting was like taking a long time to download. It was, if you remember the old days, folks, if you're listening to this and you're you're younger than 30, you might not even know this, but there was a time when you downloaded a picture and it came on the, the screen line by line, <laughs> almost like it was being printed off on your screen for you. So um, Gary was accessing the information that way uh, via illegal methods, we have to say, hacking well, into NASA I, systems. I mean, we, we say hacking. I'm just going to clear this up because I know there's going to be some computer people out there going, it's not hacking. It really wasn't hacking. Uh, it, it was basically doing screen sharing. Um, and Gary Gary just used uh, a screen sharing app to see the screen. He, he saw a bunch of files and was presented with a choice of whether to download them or to open it right there and then and see if he could grab a screenshot or something. And... Uh, yeah, I guess I guess he made the wrong choice, but I, I think a lot of us would would go for the just view it now kind of thing. Yeah, uh, but it, it meant that the image came up on screen. Someone saw that he was accessing it and just you know disconnected very quickly. I like how you've cleared up hacking, like uh, the end of the first Jurassic Park movie where the girl says, to <laughs> and all she does is guess the password. Um, yeah, to get and, into and the pretty system. much just uses a normal, like a really weird layout for a computer as well. To, yeah. To go between collections of little buildings. Very strange. So, do you know what? To be fair, Gary said himself on the, on the AMA that someone said, why didn't you just take a print out of, because he claims to have seen a picture of one of these, he's, uh, it wasn't a tic tac, not quite a saucer, to quote Sean Cahill. Um, it was <laughs> a cigar shaped, almost object with some some domes on the top and on the side. There's a that's right, yeah. There's a, a sketch of it or a CGI re- rendering of it on the AMA. Again, check out the link, folks. Um, he he doesn't believe that it's faked. He believed it was a real picture. Um, he believes because he only saw the top third of the planet that he's always just assumed it was Earth. It wasn't anywhere else. Um, someone asked him why didn't you just print the screen like you you mentioned dan about print screen and he says at the time given what he was doing it was pretty tense and yeah. when he saw this image appear on the screen he was like wow and he said he grabbed the desk and just like you say you, you view only he was taking yeah. it in and didn't think to hit print screen frustrating the, but... the same reason i think a lot of people you, you know why, why didn't you take a camera out and record i don't know yeah. i was in awe at seeing something that i thought was from another planet maybe and it just took me a second to gather my wits and by the time that happened it was gone you know yeah 100 percent. and he also got asked about the the lists of names does he remember any he said some of them seemed a little bit polish potentially if that gives you an indication of, of maybe some of the the names of these non-terrestrial officers which he specified Jimmy Church was on the list, right? <laughs> he, he did, yeah. I'll leave that <laughs> in and not cut that one out, Dan. <laughs> Jimmy's going to hunt you down for that. Um, but the, the 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 names of these officers apparently working in potentially secret space ops, which again, he's asked about, and he mentions that he does believe in his opinion there are secret space operations. He believes we have a, potentially a base on the moon, which is researching and investigating structures up there from perhaps ancient civilizations that long since died off or moved on from this planet that we're on now pretty interesting opinion and um, but i th- i think yeah, i have to is. stress he's not he never admitted uncovering evidence of that that's just his opinion based on yeah on that's going to be from, from other the areas. areas yeah um, Dan, you just shared a channel, didn't you, on um, ancient civilizations? A really good discussion. That's Again, right. It's on that Google list staff. I've got to work through. Um, can you put a note to put the link in the description for that, please? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we did tweet about it last night, but again, not everyone's on social media, so it's a. Uh, and I appreciate that, and I think we're doing better at getting and getting the messages out there to everyone, <laughs> uh, not just those that are on Twitter and such as well. Yeah, for sure. So, so that that video was basically about looking at potential past alien civilizations on this planet and by alien just mean different to us um and how that would show up in the fossil record it was very interesting and and basically the the learn from it is the right kind of natural disaster would leave no trace of uh, of an advanced civilization in the fossil record at all uh, they would be reduced to, to dust and liquid yeah basically so all, all of the speculation about the past of earth um it's we, we can only get to a certain point with actual evidence, and after that, there's a lot of conjecture. Or it could be buried under miles of ice somewhere as well. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah, I hope not, you know. Uh, no. 
too cold. Um, and a, a couple a couple of other things I thought were pretty interesting on there. Um, again, he shares his opinion on the current open position that the government seems to be portraying in terms of the discussions we're getting with senators getting involved, as we've talked about, and the, the UAP office. And he says he believes it's the start of the false alien, uh, false flag alien invasion psyop which again is a pretty out there opinion. It's one we've discussed, not one myself or yourself share, but I know there are people listening to this just now who who will see that as, as an option and who knows. But uh, again, interesting take from Gary. And another one, he was asked about the NASA administrator, Bill Nelson, and his openness to discuss the subject. And we found it quite encouraging. We've discussed that, Dan, haven't we? But he said, we don't know about their intentions, ET. So if I was in charge, I would hide it from the public until I knew a lot more. Many of us can easily accept the possibility of alien lives. Many others are actually horrified by the possibility. It really bends their worldview. So yeah, um, some interesting opinions on there, folks. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot on there that Gary has answered, basically saying, I don't know. I never saw. I uh, And it's you can get through it pretty quick, to be honest. It's a really interesting read. Um, you might not learn too much new, but I think it's interesting having someone like Gary have that conversation again to a newer, more up-to-date audience, especially as something that Reddit grows and grows and grows with yeah. younger generations on there as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Same, same as I guess we were saying earlier about Lou's, you know, new media kind of tour, that it's good to bring new people this information because not everyone knows everything. That's right. But Dan and I will still be pouring over this interview with Lou with a fine tooth comb to make sure <laughs> it's as good as it can be, as we normally do. Um, and last up, folks, we've got a James Webb telescope update. It's been a month. A lot has happened in that month, yeah. I'm sure, with the telescope. Dan, where are we at? So basically, the, the telescope is at the Lagrange point, L2. Uh, that's where it's going to be orbiting for, for the foreseeable future. Um, that's one million miles away. Um, nice, nice and conveniently, <laughs> just just for repeating that number. Um, you can actually go on the NASA website and track it. As it again, that's going to be in the link. We'll, we'll put the tracker just link there. At the moment, it's aligning all of its mirrors, basically, so it can see and it can focus. They, there was an image released not too long ago of... I think there was about 16 stars and 18, first, I believe 18. 18. So at first yeah. glance, I, I thought they were all different stars, but upon doing some reading, we, we kind of found out that actually the mirrors were all looking at one star and taking their own images of it. And they're going to use that star yeah. to align all of the focus. Um, it, it seems a lot more involved than just kind of, you know, an autofocus on your SLR camera or phone or something like that. Um, so yeah, very, I, I very seen at the stuff. time quite a lot of the comments on that the official james webb twitter was that it looked like a waste of money because look at that bloody image but like you say <laughs> there was a reason for that and i think i talked yeah. about that on one of the pods not long ago as well that it's calibrating and it's uh like you say it's not a quick calibration it takes time these objects you know these, these mirrors are aligning themselves way way out in as you see a million yeah. miles away in space and it is literally uh, is it millimeters or even less than that they probably, probably move by. less you know a lot less than that because we're you, you know we're looking at distant points of light as opposed to just the area in front of us um so yeah there's, there's a lot of work that goes into this and when are we going to get a fully functional james webb telescope done by at this point well they, this process takes a few months um probably we're looking at another like six weeks of you know just doing the alignments and the correction and stuff and then we'll be working as one mirror instead of lots of different segments um and then we should start getting our first uh first images from it awesome look forward to that uh dan that's pretty much has caught up for the month of february and um, there was a lot to go through so uh that was great i did mention on the preview pod folks coming up the listener call-in dates will be announced i'll get those sorted hopefully by the weekend for for dates next week if you want to call in for the listener call-in it'll be myself and potentially dan on as well um, email ufo uap am at gmail.com and let me know you want a listener call-in slot and i'll get those up soon uh, if you're looking to check out the new interview with Diana Pasulka, it's getting lots of really great feedback. She was brilliant to speak to. I got that one up nice and early because of the tech problems I was having and just wanted to make sure if anything else did happen, that it was already out and published. So it's available on all the paid platforms. Yeah, I know, behind a paywall. However, it does go onto the free platforms, as always, folks, and that'll be on the 7th of March. So on the 7th of March, it'll be on Patreon, Apple, Spotify, 
But if you want to spend like 50 pence, a dollar, whatever it might be, and get early access, you can do that now. Uh, you can also check it out in full on video on YouTube as well if you sign up to the, the Members Lounge. And the YouTube channel is Dan's Baby. So you're supporting Dan directly if you if you sign up on that <laughs> as well. Um, we do our best to kind of keep that running and up to date. And um, it's getting more traction as well, which is, like I said, Dan, on the, the March preview pod, I love the fact as our subscribers on that are going up which is is great and we're, we're really hoping we're putting the effort in and people appreciate that the the views are going up as well so it's nice to see that correlation that more people are subscribing but you're watching as well which makes us think we're definitely on the the right track with the content we're putting up there yeah that's right i, I actually have a question for the audience based on based on some of the youtube stats it, it tells me that people generally watch about 20 to 25 minutes and then switch off so if people could just email Andy and just let him know, like, should we keep everything to 25 minutes and just do parts? Or do you prefer me pouring it up as one? Uh, just let us know. Cool. Dan's been starting to dig into analytics. <laughs> that's why I'm an audio guy. I like the, and hi to the folks watching this on YouTube, but uh, I, I like the old audio platforms myself. But yeah, it's, you know, it's the Twitter generation and, and YouTube's a really cool platform as well. As well as that, we're going to record in a couple of days the, the Moonfall review, which has a lot of really cool themes, really interesting themes in terms of ancient civilizations, what may or may not be on the moon, stuff we'll yeah. talk about on this podcast. And not also much more interesting themes than the trailer presented i thought yes and we're also because we're both big movie fans we get to talk about the movie itself as well but always bringing it back to the the themes that we keep the the podcast around that's going to be one because it's something extra again we're doing on top of the the normal interviews it'll regularly go on to the the paid platforms but the first one will put out free for people to to check out as well but again thanks to everyone who has supported myself and dan through the the YouTube platform through Patreon, Apple, Spotify, and everything else. It's very much appreciated. It's let Dan get his new MacBook. Um, it's your crowdfunding's allowed us to get to, to Columbia or Dan to get to Columbia and represent the podcast. It's allowed me to update all this tech. Thank you very much. And if you just listen to the podcast, it's, it's amazing. And getting in touch with us is always appreciated as well. So lots to come this month. As well as that, we've got the part three. I'm just saying this off the top of my head now, Tom DeLong, we're yep. going to get recorded as well. That may or may not finish off the series. I don't know yet. It just depends when we, we get to writing it. There might be a part four. Um, yeah, it depends how busy Tom is, I guess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chris Rutkowski should round off the month with the Lou Elizondo show in the middle of the month as well, hopefully. And maybe one other guest. I'll, I'll see where the schedules are at just now. But until next time, Dan, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you for sending me to Columbia. Just, yeah, incredible. Thank you. And we'll speak soon, folks that is all for this week's show thank you very much for listening please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform you can like retweet and subscribe that would all be very much appreciated the shows are being uploaded onto youtube as we speak more and more you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that ufo podcast to access the shows ad free as well please get in touch on twitter facebook instagram that ufo podcast of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO UAP AM. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shut out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little more. Meditated game of fateful on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. I jumped back and nearly kissed myself. Then I climbed out the window after the elf. And I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head and everything was weird and everything was wet. I called up my boys. They thought this was noise. They thought it was a dream. They thought it was my toys. They thought it was my problems. And I think I should see therapy. And I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me. Consider your heart, consider time, consider your space, consider your lies, consider your life.